Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for High Velocity Radio. Welcome to the High Velocity Radio Show, where we celebrate top performers producing better results in less time. Stone Payton here with you this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming to the broadcast with Purple Fox Legal, Miss Alyssa Divine. How are you? I'm I'm doing well, and thank you for inviting me today. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Well, it's a delight to have you on the show. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. I got a ton of questions. We're probably not going to get to them all, <laughs> but but maybe a good place to start would be if you could share with me and our listeners mission, purpose, what you and your team are are really out there trying to do for folks. Absolutely. So, um. <clears throat> It, it, we do offer legal services. I, I don't like to call Purple Fox Legal a law firm, though, because that has a very negative connotation. Um, so I, I inten- I'm very intentional about being modern, being approachable, um, being at least more transparent about pricing um, and making legal um, just making legal simpler. It, it doesn't have to be so hard. Um you know, if you if you don't understand a contract, I, I think that it needs to be rewritten. That's sort of my attitude about about certain things. But and there's just a lot of misinformation about out there, too. So I'm just trying to help out entrepreneurs, um, you know, different content creators and trying to guide them in the direction um, that they that they want to go. So, you know, I had to ask, where did purple come from? What, what's the story on that? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I was very, very intentional about uh, picking something other than my name. Um, I started uh, this firm in, in September 2021. So it was right in the middle of the pandemic. Oh, wow. uh, so the the majority, um, you know, everybody was online. That's that's where everybody did their advertising. So I needed to stand out. I needed to be distinctive. Um, and so I kind of I wanted to. Uh, something that was just kind of just pop, you know? Uh, so the color purple represents wisdom and creativity. Mm. Uh, and then the Fox, of course, cleverness, but also getting out of tricky situations, which is what a lawyer does. Um, well, preferably I like, I like to prevent those tricky situations from happening at all, but I felt that, uh, that, that combination of elements, the combination of those connotations, um, represent my law firm and what I do. Well, let's dive into the backstory a little bit. What were you doing prior to this? What was the what was the path that, that brought you to having your own firm like this? Well, I didn't, at first I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. Um, I think, I think a lot of entrepreneurs might say that. Uh, and actually my first introduction to entrepreneurship was, was through my grandfather. Uh, he, he is a farmer in Indiana and has been his whole life. And uh, as I grew up, you know, I, every season I, I witnessed his struggles, you know, dealing with the incredibly high risk that is involved with farming, um, not just from like a physical safety perspective, but just, you know, from a financial business perspective, um, you know, he could not control the weather, but that was a huge determining factor for, um, you know, the, the yield of his crops at harvest. But he could spray pesticide on these crops to, you know, so, so bugs, other, other, you know, creatures didn't, you know, eat, eat his, literally eat his profits. <laughs> um, so it was all about risk mitigation. Um, and uh, I, I went to school, um, law school, and, and I got my MBA. And I kind of said to myself, well, you know, I, I can, you know, spot these issues, but why, why am I not doing it for myself? Like I, I could, why am I just doing it for myself? Why, uh, you know, I can, I can do this for a lot of other people. So I'm trying to connect the business and the legal because they're, they're often at odds. Um, and I think that's the reason that people run away from, you know, if, when they see the legal department or the HR department, they, they run away, but I, I don't want them to feel that way. So now that you've been at it a while and you started at a very 
let's call it an interesting time in <laughs> history. Yes. But now that you've That's been fair. at it a while and you're doing it your own way, what, what are you uh, finding the most rewarding? What are you enjoying the, the most about the work? I think the most rewarding thing um, is to, to see the see my clients, you know, as, as they, as they grow and are expanding their business. And, um, you know, since, since my company is pretty new, I'm, I'm growing with them. So it's more, we're, we're more of partners versus, you know, attorney client. Um, if, if that makes sense, we're, there's a lot of collaboration. Uh, and I think that's how we get the best solutions for, for people. Um, you know, the, the, the better I understand somebody's business or how they want to do business, which may not be how they're currently doing business. Uh, so we got to, got to bridge that gap. Um, and, uh, just kind of, yeah, seeing, seeing clients grow, um, and just be successful. That's really rewarding. Not all, not all attorneys, um, can, can say that, you know, the, like, for example, uh, trust and estates, you know, you don't, you don't get to see your work outside of work mm. necessarily, but I do. And that, that's rewarding to me. So, so it's motivating. Let's, let's talk about the work a little bit. Do you find yourself gravitating primarily to other people who are entrepreneurs or run small or mid market firms? Have you, have you found yourself working in a niche or two or on a specific set of uh like a category of uh, in the legal domain or what's what's the work been like so the majority of my clients uh are service based um and they're they're you know smaller or medium sized uh businesses and uh what's kind of inter- interesting to me is that um the majority of my clients are are female but why this is interesting is because the majority of my website visitors are male so i just kind of find that a little interesting Um, (laughs) but, uh, there's a, there's a great female entrepreneurship community in Nashville. It's very authentic and genuine. And I'm, I'm very grateful to be a part of it. I'll bet you are. So in my world, I come from the training and consulting world and now I'm in the media world and I have an opportunity occasionally to, to blend the two. Uh, but IP intellectual property is always, has always been a part of our career when we've created what we felt like was intellectual property. We wanted to protect it. Uh, I have run into situations over the years where someone felt like we infringed their IP and we had to have that conversation. Uh, You find yourself working through those issues quite a bit, right? Uh, Yes. Um, I think more on the preventative side, but yes, I do have people come to me you know, when they do get a cease and desist, um, you know, when somebody does come to them saying, oh, you've infringed my trademark or my copyright. Um, So, I mean, I think, I think education is kind of step one, because if you can't identify the different types of intellectual property and figure out what you have, then how are you going to protect it? So, you know, what, what trademarks do we have? Which ones should we protect? You know, it's maybe it's not necessary to register all your trademarks, but you need to register some probably. Uh, and every business has at least one trademark, uh, at least one. Um, so it's just very, very important to be aware of these issues. So you mentioned preventative just now. And earlier in our conversation, you talked about the, the agreements, the contracts being, well, or at least what I took from it was, was simple and understandable. And, you know, where, where, where you, you really do, understand what you're agreeing to and it's clearly communicated uh so i'm kind of picking up a a theme from you that let's get it right early and then we won't have to deal with all the hairy stuff later it sounds like that's a real thrust for for you and your practice yes it is and it's an incredibly popular approach uh as as i'm sure you could guess uh it it just it just doesn't have like not Everything legal has to be hard. It just doesn't have to be so hard. We can make things better. We can be more transparent about pricing. We can make contracts, uh, you know, where a one paragraph isn't a whole page, single space. Uh, you know, we can we can do better. I think we can do better, and I'm and I'm uh, actively trying to do better for my clients, for my community. Well, so many small business people, at least in the, the circles that I run in. You know, sometimes we have to take a few risks. We throw our hat over the fence. We fly by our seat of the pants and we get to a point where things are starting to to work. 
and I think maybe some of us, I, I'll, I'll at least speak to myself, you know, I'm, I might have the tendency to, uh, to leave some things undone that could really hurt me down, down the road. And, and I guess I'm operating under the impression, uh, maybe before, but certainly after you get just a little bit of traction, you need to, you need to at least, uh, take some kind of inventory and get someone with some professional expertise to say, okay, Stone, you're an equity partner in this, uh, network. You've got your own studio. You're doing some consulting. Here's some, you know, is that what it looks like early on? Like, like, talk to me a little bit about what the, what the relation, the client relationship and the early work looks like. Do you just sit down and try to get a feel for their business and the kind of contracts they are writing? And yeah, walk us through that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, I think that's, that's part, that's all part of it. Um, another part of it is about a conversation about, you know, what, what's your long-term goal here? Like, is this, um, you know, is this going to be like a family business? Are you going to sell this business, um, to, you know, others in the future or well in the short term, even future. Um, so those kind of conversations help, help guide my thinking and, and kind of what needs to be done because, uh, you know, if you if you buy or sell a business, there's there's a lot of due diligence involved with that. And one of the most important parts is the trademarks. Where did you get the trademarks? How like are they registered? Uh, you know, when when was it first used? Um, all those things are very, very important. And if everyone doesn't if, 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 a, if a seller doesn't have all their ducks in a row, that can cause a huge, huge problem. And um greatly diminish the value of their business if you know if they do want to sell um but there's also just business succession planning so kind of like taking like looking at the long term like are we are we going into different states um and kind of like working my way backwards uh so to speak to to prevent all these different types of problems but i think i think the trademarks is, is sort of the core um sort of the, just the starting point because if you don't have a brand you don't have a business they're 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 intertwined very very closely um but uh yeah there's also just a lot of different contracts so like for websites you have to have a privacy policy in terms of use um you know if you don't then you, you could be violating consumer protection laws like just kind of getting getting the foundation right is is, is critical absolutely critical you can't scale, you can't grow unless you have the foundation set up. Absolutely. So I bet you're running into uh, patterns. I bet you see some of the same mistakes over and over and you're like, <laughs> maybe you don't say it out loud. You're like, okay, here we go again. <laughs> yep. Seen this before. What, what are some of the, the common mistakes or the, the common things that are undone or, or done wrong that you're like running into over and over w w with your clients or before they're your clients? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, going back to trademarks, uh, That's a big people idea. will start a business. It, it's, it's so, so important. So they'll start a business. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll bring customers, they'll develop a website, they'll spend all this money and time and resources building this brand. And then they get a cease and desist. Mm. And then there's litigation. Then they have to change their brand. In addition to paying all those litigation costs, the average cost of a trademark uh lawsuit is actually four hundred thousand dollars holy moly yeah wow. so that's that's quite a bit of money and that's you know that's obviously not including any cost of rebranding which is also incredibly expensive at least tens of thousands of dollars depending on where the business was um you know in in their in their growth journey of growth but getting that right is so critical and it's 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 much easier and cheaper to prevent these problems. So I like to tell people um, like what, what the, what a good process would be is to do a trademark clearance search for a name that you want to pick, mm. want to use. Um, then once you do that, then uh, you want to secure the domain names, the social media handles, all those sorts of things. And then you file the paperwork to create the, the LLC or other business entity. And then you file the trademark. So, why you do it in that order is because you want the LLC or your business entity to be the owner of the trademark and mm -hmm. you want that name to be on the registration. 
So that has to exist before you file the registration. But it, those two things should be done very quickly because there are a lot of, um, I'll just say, bad actors who, who watch those sort of things and, uh, oh, you know, right. steal up domain names and social media and all those sorts of things, which uh, used to be actually a huge, huge problem um, about 20 years ago. And I think I think we're going to see a little bit of that now that we have the, uh, the dot AI. Um, uh, you know, like dot com dot AI. Uh-huh. So uh, the URLs. I've actually got a couple of questions around AI and how that impacts your practice and your clients in, in just a moment. But I'm curious, yeah. when you made the leap into entrepreneurship, did, um, first of all, I'd love for you to just describe what that was like. It's, I mean, it's got to be a little bit unnerving if you're accustomed to coming from a what a lot of people envision as a more secure environment but did you have somebody coaching you through that transition or a mentor anything like that or did you just dive in head first and just trial by fire and you just made your way through it maybe maybe a little bit more of the second um (laughs) i I realized in my in my last year of law school that this that starting my own business was going to be a possibility and that i needed to educate myself uh as much as possible um about about starting a business in general, um, you know, managing a business, but also just kind of different um, elements regarding the legal industry. So, for example, there are a lot of restrictions around um, legal marketing. So, you know, just kind of making sure that I, you know, was very aware and cognizant of those roles. Um, But yeah, that was a, I think, I think I sort of, you know, did a bunch of research and, and, I watched videos and, and uh, attended CLEs and all that sort of thing for, for probably about a year before I started my business. So um, I, I I don't I don't want to say I kind of jumped in head first, travel by fire. Um, I guess it kind of was a little bit after that, but but I did a lot of prep work. I did a lot of prep work. Well, but that's your wheelhouse, right? I mean, that's what makes you such such a good attorney is you know how to do the research. It's something that uh, that you enjoy doing. And you know that, and and you go through and uh, check all those boxes. So, well, well, that's encouraging. You mentioned legal marketing, and there are some parameters that you have to operate within. How does the whole sales and marketing thing work for a for a practice like yours? Like, do you have to go out and market, or or is it more of an educate kind of process? I I, I don't know how you go out and sell legal business. I'm convinced if someone sits down. And as a conversation with you, you know, and they're like, well, yeah, we need to talk. And, you know, oh, boy, yeah. <laughs> where have you been? Uh, yeah. But like that first conversation, how, how does that, do you have like process, you have some sort of sales and marketing process or something? Um, You know, I have kind of like my intro pitch, but, you know, we, one of the, one of the legal marketing rules is that you cannot solicit people, um, you know, live, either in person or by phone. Wow. So no cold calling uh, or anything like that. Absolutely. Huh. That's, that's definitely not okay. Is that um, everywhere? The, is that pretty much all over the country or is that kind of state uh, by state or do you know? Yeah, that's, that's pretty, sta- that's a pretty standard rule across, across states. Wow. So, um, so, you know, I, you know, when I go to different networking meetings and stuff, like I can't just go out and hand people business cards because that would violate that rule. I have to wait basically for them to ask me for that information. Huh. So it's, it's, it's very, restrictive i'll say yeah. but uh but i do f- I, f- I focus my sales and marketing efforts on education um because once i you know obviously want to provide value right. um and you know people you know that get that information they can they can see and realize oh wait this is this is an issue with my business like i, I need to get in touch with this person um and the exception to to that kind of prohibition against live solicitation is what if you've had like a prior relationship with somebody um or if they're like a family member or something like that but Mm -hmm. uh i'll just say it's there for a good reason but it's also it's also makes it very hard for us well i bet it does and so you but you do have a great deal of um specific expertise and experience in this domain and there's so much that most business owners don't know. We don't even know what we don't know, right? So if there's a mm-hmm. place for us to go that's credible, 
to learn a little bit about trademarks. And, and it's probably not only new information, but probably uh, unlearning some things because we probably have some misconceptions or misbeliefs mm-hmm. and we just got it wrong. And, but if there's a, play, a repository or a person or a, somewhere where we can go and say, oh, let me watch this little video or listen to this audio or read this article or something. And then over mm-hmm. time, then I guess you're building credibility. And I'm like, OK, yeah, I'm going to reach out and, uh, and and talk to the purple mm-hmm. folks. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I um, well, actually, a, a good example of that would be um, sometimes I try to. I can convince people to accept payments in a certain way and that can help automate their bookkeeping. And, I'm, mm. and I kind of like educate them a little bit about that. Sometimes, you know, maybe I'll talk to their bookkeeper or CPA to set up, you know, the QuickBooks side of things. But, um, you know, if you do cash and checks, like that's, that's a lot, a lot harder to automate. So they're taking mm. more time to do that. We're hiring somebody to take care of that. Well, if they, you know, accept payments through, you know, something like Stripe or, or other types of things, um, and we put that in the contract, they can automate that. They can, they can save money and time by doing things a certain way. So I try to think about those things in addition to the legal protection. Um, I think operational efficiency is, is also maybe undervalued, um, hmm. but, I, but I think it's important. Well, it seems to me like you would never run out of topics. I mean, you, you probably have this whole big list anyway, and just going out into the marketplace and having conversations with people and this, just listening to them talk about their challenges and even their victories, probably like every time you go somewhere, you're like, okay, I got three more topics. I'm going to go, I'm going to go write an article or I'm going to do a YouTube or a whatever. I, I bet you would never run out of topics. <laughs> yeah, I I think that's probably true. Uh, unfortunately, I would I would run out of time to create those videos. So. <laughs> I hear you. I, I do want to talk about AI. Of course, it's all the rage at, at this at, at this mm-hmm. point. My business partner specifically is very fired up about it. Uh, it's it's helping him uh, craft even like crafting questions for interviews, and and there must be mm-hmm. a gazillion other use cases for it. Uh, what impact, if any, is AI having on, on your world and, and maybe even on uh, some of the, the, the folks you're working with, like these sm- other small business people? Are you starting mm-hmm. to see it have some impact? Yes. And uh, the law is still trying to catch up to those sorts of things. So we're applying, mm. you know, the technology is probably a good 20 or 30 years ahead ahead of the law. So. Uh, we have to we have to be creative in how we apply the law and interpret the law a little bit. But uh, as far as how it affects the legal industry, um, there was a, a New York attorney um, um, who unfortunately created a brief using AI. Um, the problem with that was that the cases cited, the different resources cited within that brief, were not real. Um, and then mm. yes. Yes, this this actually happened, uh, and you know, you, there were fines imposed against against that attorney, um, and I'm sure that client was very unhappy with that. Um, so, I mean, that's ex- expecting AI to do e- everything and right. basically be a person is probably not a good expectation or standard to have. I'll say, <laughs> um, in terms of how it affects, you know, you know, content creators, entrepreneurs. Um, there, you know, there are a variety of, of, of use, uses for it. Um, and for, for, from my perspective, the, the danger is in using it for content creation. So we're seeing more and more mm. lawsuits or disputes about, about AI, about copyright infringement. So there's OpenAI um, has, been, has been sued by a number of authors for copyright infringement. Um, and it's, it's kind of a question of, well, is there actually copyright infringement because who's creating the work? The AI. But, but it's not the company who created OpenAI that's doing the prompts either. So, and creative works that are created by AI aren't copyrightable. So there's like, there's like the big question. And then there's like so many different, like kind of sub parts to that question that we have to kind of figure out so that, uh, we can we can evaluate risk, mitigate risk, uh, and you know maybe 
maybe edit some contracts and stuff like that. But I will, I, I'm not anti AI at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think that there is a very, you have to be wary about it for content creation. Um, but there, it is incredibly helpful for, you know, like interview developing interview questions or, um, you know, getting, getting ideas for social media, uh, post, um, other types of things. I, I think, I think that it is extremely useful in the operational process. Um, and I've, you know, I've, I've heard, I've heard from different people how, how they use it. And I, I, I think it is a great benefit. I would just be very wary about the content creation part. <laughs> well, it's a brave new world and uh, job security for you, right? There'll be all kind of precedent <laughs> like and different cases that come up and you'll be able to. So uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, I'm interested to hear about what passions, if any, you have outside the scope of your of your work. My listeners know that I like to hunt, fish, and travel. Uh, So when I'm not, you know, visiting with with folks like you and learning about their world, you know, we go and do. And and are there is is there something you have a tendency to nerd out about or really dive into (laughs) outside the the legal profession? Uh, well, I, th- I think just learning in general, honestly, I love watching documentaries. So, um, one of my favorite docu-series is actually called, uh, the food that built America. I don't know if you've seen that or heard of that. It's, uh, a, 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 a history ch- on the history channel. Um, but it, it goes through, uh, the hi- you know, the history in the beginning of a lot of different, uh, global, or, well, yeah, global brands that we, that we have today. So, like Hershey, um, Heinz, uh, Kellogg, all these different people. And it's so fascinating to kind of see their, honestly, their entrepreneurial journey, their struggles, um, and maybe some of the not good decisions (laughs) decisions that they made. Um, And how how the world was a little different back then. Uh, But, um, you know, I think, the well, the episode with uh, Milton Hershey was really interesting to me because, um, at whenever I first watched it, I, I didn't understand the concept of a company town. Mm. Um, so it's kind of like my introduction to that, and I was like, "Wow, that's really cool!" Like, um, you know, he cared so much about his employees, like he made a town. Um, so just just kind of like being introduced to that, and and also just the story of the underdog. You know, a lot, a lot of those a lot of those folks were either immigrants or, or first, you know, first generation mm-hmm. Americans. And that, that creates a lot of struggles in and of itself. So, um, yeah, just kind of coming from nothing and then, you know, building this empire, like that's, that's always a very fascinating story. Well, I'm so glad I asked uh, for a lot of reasons, not the least of which I wrote down, uh, it's, it's the food that built America. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to go. That's I, right. love, I like the documentaries as well. And it sounds like you learn about how they built their business. And so so thank you for that. All right. Before we wrap, um, I'd love to, if we could leave our listeners with just a couple of uh, actionable tips. Uh, the, number one tip, gang, is if you've got a question, reach out and, and, and talk to Alyssa or somebody on her team and 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 do that. But short of that, is there something that small business people, mid-market folks, uh, people like me could be doing, not doing, reading, uh, you know, j- just a-, a couple of things that we could take a little immediate action on. Absolutely. Uh, I think, yeah, there are a couple of different things. So um, one is just to assess the different types of IP your business has. Hmm. Like that, that doesn't require, you know, hiring an attorney necessarily. Just, just identify all those different things. Um, another is to make sure your website has, you know, those policies that we talked about, the privacy policy, terms of use. Um, but also to make sure that your website is, a, you know, ADA compliant. That is, um, I've been seeing a very big increase in uh, those types of lawsuits. Um, so definitely in that, that's, you know, as simple as, you know, downloading a plugin. Um, that's that's a very easy fix, but it can it can be very disastrous if, if it's if your website is not ADA compliant. Um, and then I think third is, you know, when was the last time your contracts were reviewed by an attorney, if ever? Mm. You know, can they be updated? Do they reflect the, your process, your client journey process accurately? Is there a way to improve that? What can we use contract law 
to to solve pain points. That's well, that's another thing I kind of focus on. I, uh, I I I usually tell people, you know, I I think entrepreneurs should ask two questions. So how how do how do they want people to feel when they encounter their brand? How do they make that a possibility? Very well said. All right, what's the best way for our listeners to learn more, have a more substantive conversation with you or someone on your team? What's the best way for them to connect with you and, and tap into your work? The best way to contact us is purplefoxlegal.com. Uh, we are also on social media, Instagram and Facebook, and have a, a ton of different tips and, and educational posts um, to begin to help people out. Marvelous. Well, Alyssa, it has been an absolute delight having you on the show this afternoon. Thank you for sharing your insight and your perspective and and keep up the good work because uh, we need you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Until next time, this is Stone Payton for our guest today with Purple Fox Legal, Miss Alyssa Devine, and everyone here at the Business Radio X family saying we'll see you in the fast lane.